Confounding, exhilarating, and contagious. Emotions matter, and so does applying emotional intelligence. Welcome to Dan Hill's EQ Spotlight, the podcast where emotions rule. Whatever the topic, how do hearts and minds collide? Find out with your host, a college professor turned globetrotting EQ entrepreneur. His mission? Each week, Dan joins prominent authors in decoding how emotions drive outcomes and make people tick. Now, on to the show. Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining me for the 15th episode of my podcast, Dan Hill's EQ Spotlight. The series appears here on the New Books Network, which has as its motto, sharing knowledge so people can thrive. Today's topic is exploring misunderstandings about Trump's quote-unquote deplorable fans. With me is John Hibbing. He's the author of The Securian Personality, What Really Motivates Trump's Base, and why it matters for the post-Trump era. John's book is published by Oxford University Press. John R. Hibbing is the Foundation Regents Professor of Political Science at the University of Nebraska. He's been named a NATO Fellow in Science and a Guggenheim Fellow. His previous works include Stealth Democracy, as well as Predisposed, liberals, conservatives, and the biology of political differences. His media appearances include Star Talk, The Hidden Brain, and The Daily Show. John, welcome to this show. Thank you for having me, Dan. Oh, by all means, look forward to it. Lots to discuss here. So to begin, what's the Securian personality all about? Or to be even more precise, what are one or two of the key misunderstandings that people have regarding Trump's staunchest supporters? Well, I guess my motivation in writing the book was that I felt there were a lot of, of misconceptions about Trump's base. Um, and on the demographic side, for example, the notion that they are, are poor um, and that they're entirely consisting of, of uh, people who are white males who are uneducated um, and who are deeply religious. Um, on, the, on the emotional and psychological side, the notion that they're bitter and angry and resentful and, and fearful. Uh, I just wondered if that was really true. And it occurred to me that people really hadn't investigated this much. And when I mentioned to my colleagues, I was writing a book on Trump's base, they would say that that's going to be a short book. They're just ignorant racists. And I'd say, well, you know, they may or may not be that. I'm, I'm not drawing a conclusion on that, but I'm saying, let's put that aside and try to figure out what's really going on inside their heads. They don't think they're racist. So, so why is that? So the goal of the book is to really kind of figure out uh, what they are, what they're really thinking, and why they are so different than many of the rest of us. Well, uh, and I really appreciate that. And one of the things I like about the book is how it opens, where you say, "I'm going to get in my car and go over to Missouri, and I'm going to actually hang out with these people and see what goes on." Many, many years ago in graduate school, I was taking a course on John Milton. I said to myself, "I don't think I have anything more to say about Paradise Lost than it's been already written." So instead, I went down to Liberty, <clears throat> excuse me, Liberty University in Virginia and observe how fundamentalists taught Milton, because I thought that would be far more interesting. So you said a few things that Trump supporters aren't based on people's stereotypes. Can we go a bit deeper into what they are then? Sure. Yeah, that's that's uh, really where the, the rubber hits the road. Um, you know, there, there's a long literature that points out that, that uh, conservatives are uh, angry and fearful and that they it's not just political things, but that on normal everyday life, that they're they're more worried about uh, about all kinds of situations that they might enter into, and especially as the coronavirus situation unfolded, that just struck me as as really not very true. As we look around the world and the country, especially, we see that a lot of times it's conservatives that seem to be taking this more casually. They they resent being told to wear masks, and I think this is especially true of of Trump's base. So, uh, and also I noticed that groups like kind of bikers for Trump, we, and Sturgis is going on as we're recording this interview right now, where we have 250,000 people that have uh, descended mostly on, on Harleys into a small community in South Dakota. So, and, and they're not exactly conformists. They kind of like to be rebels. So it just, it seemed to me that this, this image we had of, of Trump's base as being uh, deeply religious and, and very conformist wasn't, wasn't so true. And uh, I did a, a national survey. I t- was able to commission this with uh, YouGov, which is a, a reputable national polling organization, actually international. 
and I had uh, 1,800 people in the sample, so it was, it was quite large. And we oversampled Trump's base so that we could really get a, a feel for who they who they were. And uh, you know, as I kind of suspected, it turns out they're not angry and they're not fearful. Now, part of this could be because they have Trump in the White House right now, so they're feeling pretty uh, pretty good. But even that's interesting when you think about it, because the conventional wisdom was that just across the board, Trump venerators or Trump's base is going to be uh, really uh, concerned and, and angry and fearful and resentful. And if that's not true, and, and if it, it varies depending on who's in office, then I think that's a very different vision that we have. Um, to, to go back to your original question, what are they then? Uh, it really does come down to this kind of insider-outsider distinction. And what I found, the strongest differentiations I got with, with all the questions I asked, I think there were 250 items in my survey, and where we really got major differences between Trump supporters and other conservatives, by the way, I'm not just comparing them to liberals, would be on issues like immigration and gun control uh, and, and race. And that's where you saw this notion that Trump space seems to have a very strong and some would say narrow definition of who an insider is. And anybody who's an outsider, especially uh, immigrants and people who uh, aren't Christians and people who support those individuals are kind of fellow travelers. Those are the ones we have to be concerned about. And so that to me is the essence. And that's why I call the book The Securitarian Personality, because they're really after not authority, as a lot of people maintain, but uh, security from what they see as outsiders. Okay, so it's a vision that's that's cultural, it's personal identity, but they, but they still do want security in some way. Isn't that where the, the term securitarian comes from as opposed to unitarian? That's right. Uh, no, that's a good point. They, they do want security. I think that's, that's key. Um, and I make the argument that they, they don't want authority because if you think about it, you know, it's, it's only a very specific kind of authority that they resonate to. They, they certainly didn't like it when Barack Obama signed a lot of executive orders. Um, and they don't like being told what to do, as we see with the mask situation uh, during, during COVID. But what they do want is to be secure from outsiders. And so it's, it's uh, it is a specific type of security, not just they're, they're not going around saying, you know, I want to curl up in a ball and, and uh, I'm worried about disease or I'm worried about clowns or death. In my survey, I actually found that liberals tended to be more concerned about those types of things. But then if you shift it around to things like threats from foreign countries, uh, immigrants, uh, that's where you see a, a really big difference. And that's where the desire for security comes into play. Okay, yeah, you kind of take the words from my mouth because I was reading the book and I was saying, yeah, these are people who are not exactly huddled in the fetal position. Yeah. They might want security, but you know, they're not you know, feeling like they're in a defensive mode in terms of, you know, well, let's go into the next question. You, you talked about them being extroverts, in fact. Let's go down the psychological rabbit hole for a bit here. So you, you say they're kind of a, a different version of Teddy Roosevelt's famous speak loudly but carry, you know, speak softly but carry a, a big stick. So, so if you look at Trump's personality versus a, a Teddy Roosevelt or an Andrew Jackson or a Nixon, I want to go to Trump supporters here in a moment, but let's just stay with Trump for a moment. What's his personality in your point of view using particularly the big five factor? Yeah, I know. I know you've written yourself, Dan, on the, the emotionality of, of leaders and personality traits. So I'm not sure I could add a whole lot to that. I mean, the book does focus on Trump supporters. There have been a lot of good books written on, on Trump himself. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I didn't survey Trump. So I'm, I'm, I, sure. when I talk about him, I'm mostly just speculating. But I do think this emphasis on strength is something that you see, and not, not just strength for the country, but also personal strength. That's a big deal to him. And it's a big deal to most of his supporters as well. So that doesn't exactly map onto the, uh, the big five. Uh, but I do think if, if you were pressing me on kind of what's going on inside their heads, that would be something that it really distinguishes them from other conservatives, by the way, who probably think it's a good idea for a country to be strong. But for Trump supporters, that's more than a good idea. It's, it's kind of a way of life. So I think there's personal strength and then that translates into strength for a country as well. That would be a, a really important basis. Okay. Well, I also previously wrote a book actually on uh, American festivals, including Sturgis. So I've, oh, wow. I've I've spent some time there. I came across in my black t-shirt and parked my Nissan car on the edge of town so I wouldn't offend anybody. You'll have to uh, send but, me pictures. Yeah, but I, I know Sturgis well. Um, so when we go to these big five factors, I'm talking about the personality traits of openness and conscientiousness and extroversion, agreeableness and neuroticism. If I read your book correctly, the you know, there was lots of differentiation between Trump supporters and traditional conservatives. 
uh, including, for instance, less neuroticism, but more of each of the other four traits. But if I'm taking it right, it's extroversion that maybe really maps them as the biggest difference from conservatives, or, or is it a little bit different than that? Oh, yeah, no, I think that's that's an important factor. I do think they're, these are people that are willing to put themselves out there, um, you know, as we've found in a lot of family reunions and various discussions that we all have uh, these days, they're not shrinking violets. So I think that's uh, something that is a little bit different because most of this traditional literature on personality and politics did find that uh, conservatives were uh, less open to new experiences and more conscientious. And uh, here I, I'm finding that if, if anything, um, uh, Trump venerators are fairly open to new experiences. At least they say. Remember, that's one of the difficulties with, with these personality items is a sure. self-report. Particularly that one. Yes, yeah. self-report's always a boondoggle, potentially. Well, one of the things that, that uh, strikes me there was how much there was a separation potentially between Trump and traditional conservatives. Because I just saw a poll, oh, must have been the last two weeks, was on NBC, I believe. And they said that people who are planning to vote for Trump, 85% of the reason was the man himself. It had nothing to do with him being the GOP nominee. And when you looked at the Biden supporters or likely supporters, I mean, it was really, you know, first of all, he's not Trump. Second of all, he's the Democratic nominee. And finally, third, you know, he's Joe Biden. So it's almost the direct opposite of the two. I mean, what's going to happen post-2020? I mean, assuming Trump doesn't find a way to change the Constitution and, and uh, you know, wins this time and wants to run again in 2024, I mean, where will these kinds of supporters go? It doesn't seem like they are a, a natural fit for the GOP at this point. I think you raise a really good point. And that's one of the things I, I address in the last chapter of the book, where I really try to say what's what's going to happen. Obviously, I'm not going to make specific predictions, but I do think it's it's a potential challenge for the Republican Party. I mean, this this element of the Republican coalition, a, an element that's very focused on, on security from outsiders, that has as its most important issues, immigration, defense, gun rights, and law and order. I mean, that group is really important in the Republican Party. So it may be that they're able to weather the storm that I think a lot of us see coming with, with Trump's departure whenever it, it is. Um, on the other hand, it, it may be that once Trump's supporters have kind of had their guy uh, in office, their moment in the sun, it could be a little bit more difficult for them to go back and accept a more traditional Republican nominee in 2024 or whenever it might be. So, um, you know, I think, I think that's a, a definite challenge. A lot of it, you're right to point out this a devotion to the person himself, if, if that's really what it is. And if Trump continues to act as he does, which I'm almost certainly will, you know, he's, he's not the kind of guy that's eager to, to groom a successor. Uh, he, he tends to like, want the focus of attention on him. So this potentially could be a really big challenge. If Trump's base is still kind of salivating about Trump himself and the Republican Party, the rest of it is trying to go on uh, as, as they did prior to Trump then I think potentially there's a challenge. Now, yeah. before, before Democrats get too you know, excited <laughs> about those possibilities of the Republican Party ripping itself apart, I do want to stress that uh, even Republicans who are not Trump supporters, they still uh, have usually as kind of their second or third issue things like immigration, defense, gun rights, and law and order. So it's not like what Trump has been for, they've been against and they've gone along grudgingly. It's just that that, that might have been their, not been their top priority they emphasize a little bit more likely to emphasize things like health care and the economy. Uh, but they still care a, a, quite a bit about immigration, defense, gun rights, and law and order. So that's the kind of uh, back and forth that I, is going on in my head, I guess. I see the potential for a Republican split, but then I also say, well, it's not as though the priorities are fundamentally different. It's just that they're ranked those most important issues just a little bit different. Yeah, but they, they still need, of course, someone to galvanize them and whatever his shortcomings as a leader, you know, Trump is someone who loves to be on the campaign stump. You know, that's that's his element. Uh, I mean, I've gone back and looked at all the presidential races, and in most cases, uh, I've found that the person who actually likes to be out <laughs> and, uh, you know, mingle with people tends to be the more effective uh, campaigner and, and tends to get to the White House. Uh, for one thing, I've, I've looked at every presidential debate since 1960, and I've facially coded them. And Trump stands out because GOP tends to lean, the GOP candidates tend to show two emotions more so than the Democrats. One is fear and one is anger. And certainly Trump showed plenty of anger in the debates uh, in 2016. 
But Trump does not show fear. I mean, not very often, at least. One of the few times I can remember was when he was asked about, uh, you know, how big of a tent he was going to get on the abortion issue and how much he was going to criminalize uh, doctors who, you know, proceed with offering abor- abortions. That was one time where I saw him nervous for a moment, wondering just how he was going to parse the issue. But otherwise, rarely do I see fear from the guy. So, you know, trying to imagine a, a candidate who's going to be strong. I mean, is it Rubio? Is it, uh, you know, the Missouri uh, senator? I mean, who, who do you see as someone who could take that mantle? Well, I think it's going to be going to be tough. You know, you hear talk of guys like Tom Cotton or one of the Trump children. But uh, I don't think any of those are really going to please uh, Trump's base. Um, I liked your point about about the lack of fear. I think that's really important for a securitarian, this kind of bluster, uh, to use a pejorative term, I guess. But, uh, sure. That, you know, they really want to project that because I think one of the misunderstandings about Trump supporters is that they're really aggressive militarily. And I think that's that's wrong. And it's wrong about Trump himself. He's basically an isolationist. You know, he's a, a wall builder, not an interventionist. He'd rather bring the troops home and make Fortress America. And in that sense, uh, you know, a lot of times we hear uh, Trump supporters described as fascists. Uh, and I, I think that's probably misleading in the sense that typically fascists want to take over the world. And that's not what we see with, with these guys. They really wanted to have kind of gated communities and border walls uh, and have a lot of deterrence. That's their major thing. In fact, if deterrence fails, I'm not sure they've got a really good backup plan. But they think if they have this bluster and this lack of fear, they can intimidate other countries or other people, um, and and keep them from uh, from doing any harm or invading. So I'm glad you brought that up because I think that is a really important feature. Uh, and you're right. When I went to the Trump rally in Missouri, um, he certainly was in his element, uh, and I think he's chafing a little bit now. You know, not being able to get out with some of the COVID concerns, uh, and and we'll have to see how that plays out in the actual general election campaign in the few, next months. Yeah, when you mentioned uh, walls and gates and so forth, it takes me, it's one of the things you keep mentioning as fitting the profile of issues that matter to Trump's closest supporters, and that's guns and gun rights. So um, before this interview, I went on a website and looked at some of the findings that Pew Research Foundation has detected. Uh, One is there's certainly a Republican tilt in terms of who are gun owners, about two to one. even more than two to one, Republicans over Democrats. It's also interesting why they give as the reason for owning guns and its protection twice as large as hunting or using guns, you know, for, for sport. Um, So where is this going to go? I mean, we just saw the NRA uh, being challenged and, you know, by the New York attorney general's office, Uh, Trump's response was they should go ahead and move to, to Texas. Um, are we going to see some, you know, belligerent action in this case because they think the stakes are so high and it's about protection or, or what? Because I, I do take your point that these are not people who are interventionist, at least not overseas. Yeah, uh, good point. The uh, one question that I liked in the survey was if you had a choice between having a really strong national defense and military or being able to own have private ownership of guns, which would you take? And uh Trump's base overwhelmingly went for the guns. So I think this is an interesting concept. They certainly uh, like the military. They like the fact that Trump increased spending for the military. But if push comes to shove, they'd really rather defend themselves than have somebody else defend them, even if it's a military that they uh, that they love. So this, this notion, I have some quotes from uh, uh, David French and others in the National Review talking about why people own guns and why they like to carry and you're certainly right. It's it's not to hunt. Uh, another question I had in the survey was whether they had hunted or fished in the last five years. And Trump supporters were actually less likely than people in other political groups to have done that. I mean, barely. But the point is, they're, they're certainly not using those guns to hunt. They like the feeling that they get. It's back to that notion of being, uh, you know, kind of intimidating and having a, uh, knowing that 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 revolver is in the closet, uh, just gives them a, a, a supportive feeling that I don't think the rest of us who are not maybe uh, devoted to gun ownership can appreciate. So that's one of my lessons. And, and they, again, they'd rather have this protection being done by themselves. They feel good about that when that happens than have somebody else do it. Um, not that they are opposed to the military, but that personal protection and, and being uh, having personal agency, I guess, in their protection is really important to them. 
Okay, so so the, follow me then, because I'm thinking about okay, and I, and I can take your point that they are not fascist or authoritarian. They don't want to impose on others. It's more that they want to protect what they have and what they see as central to the country. But if they saw the fabric of society declining in their point of view, if they saw uh, you know protesters like Chicago just last night in uh, Portland, Oregon, many nights. Um, is there a point at which they would band together and take actions, or are they really quite separate from the the right wing militias that we we see out and about at times, including in Germany? I'm not quite sure what you mean by band together. I mean that would be interesting what what that would entail, and and certainly they don't like the protesters. I've been in communication with one Trump supporter that I, I met uh, during my my research, and she is just absolutely. Um, terrorized by what's going on in Portland. You know, this notion that people who uh, maybe aren't the same skin color, who don't have quite the same respect for the police are kind of getting together and doing things and maybe engaging in some property damage. Again, that I, I don't suppose anybody likes some of those things, property damage and all, but uh, it, it strikes Trump supporters in a way, they, they're securitarians, I should say, in a way that I think other people can't quite understand. And I think, you know, will they band together? You know, they're, they're happy for somebody to do about it, do something about it. Um, but they're also quite willing to think that they need to take this into their own hands, that they need to take steps to have security in their homes, to uh, have a place in the country, to stockpile uh, gold uh, or whatever it might be and, and have lots of ammunition ready. So I, I think that's, that's a very important impulse that is uh, present among Trump's base. Okay. Yeah. By, by band together, I'm not even sure if I know what I mean necessarily, but I, I did notice a couple of news stories like, uh, for instance, there was going to be a rally for George Floyd uh, in Idaho in, in a smaller town. And when they showed up to to hold their, their protests and support, uh, you know, I guess I'll also say more, more right wing types. I'm not sure if they were organized entirely. Uh, but there were, a, a, you know, a bunch of people who showed up and were, were quite intimidating with large weapons. And, um, you yeah, know, the day passed peacefully, uh, but there was some foreboding there, uh, I guess, is what, I, what I'm bringing up as a specter. Yeah, they definitely think that we need to stand up to these people who are outsiders and who are supporting outsiders. You know, this is this is a threat to uh, to all that they hold dear. And yeah, if, if that means supporting the military, they'll do that. If it means getting together in a militia, they'll do that. If it means going off to their bunker, they'll do that. Okay. One of the things that uh, also came up in your in your book and in your, your sur- survey data was, you're right, th- these are people who sometimes might be seen as, you know, economic losers, but in fact, they're, they're quite, you know, decently affluent in many cases. Where might they go in the future? And I, I say this in terms of I, I'm seeing some political commentators saying we might be facing a situation where some people are in favor of democracy, uh, particularly a democracy that they think might be more... Uh, leveling or fair or address some inequalities and others who may very much give in to, I guess I'll call it more of an oligarchy, that that's a way to to have structure and allows that those that are wealthier uh, will maintain their rights and uh, their privileges and uh, their ability to exert influence, if not control, uh, on the culture, society, the economy, etc. Where might these Trump supporters, the strongest among them, go if there's really this this bifurcation, this this friction between oligarchy versus democracy? Well, they go firmly on the side of oligarchy in, in that case. I mean, I think uh, my argument in the book is that Trump supporters are not as concerned about economics as we might think. Uh, but let me qualify that. Uh, certainly they have economic concerns, but they see a lot of the concerns through these more social kinds of lenses. They think people who talk about uh, you know, mitigating inequality, they're basically just trying to give money to outsiders. And again, outsiders don't have to be people who are outside the country, but people who don't fit their kind of white Christian male, uh, fourth generation American vision of things. So, um, you know, they they generally are opposed to things like welfare spending because they think that's money that money is going to go to people who are not really insiders. They don't like uh, regulations not so much for pure economic reasons, but because they think this is a way that the government could kind of emasculate citizens. And eventually, you know, if they can take away our right to, uh, you know, throw corrugated cardboard in the, in the trash, 
then they can probably take away our right to hold a gun and things like that. So I think they're, uh, they're just, to me, it still comes back to security, even though a lot of these things are couched kind of in, in economic terms. Okay. Well, what I'm hearing really cl- clearly as I'm listening to your answer is don't tread on me. Uh, that, that banner that you do see at, at rallies sometimes. Yeah, I think that's right. So if we, you know, and so much of the support is around Trump, and I think I agree with you that I don't see at the moment someone who's readily going to step up and, and take over this this mantle. Uh, ben Sassy from your state is certainly a very different person than, than Donald Trump. How about within Trump's ever-evolving cabinet and circle of advisors? Is there anybody that you think, uh, I don't see them necessarily as a political leader, but someone who uh, really fits the kind of uh, person that uh, Trump supporters are in favor of? I'm thinking about people from Stephen Miller to William Barr to Jared Kushner, uh, Ivanka, Mike Pompeo, Kellyanne Conway, um, Mike Pence, any of those kind of fit the mold of someone they like, even if that may not be the next generation leader? Yeah, I think all those have, have possibilities. Well, I, actually, a few of those, I suppose you mentioned, are not probably going to throw their hat in the ring in terms of a potential presidential candidate, but they all certainly are are cut from that cloth. And yeah, I think you're right to bring up guys like Stephen Miller. I mean, the this notion of securitarian and the, the view of the world as a battle between so-called insiders and outsiders um, you know, I, I think that's never been clearer than it is in in the words of Stephen Miller. Yeah, he of all the people, he really strikes me <laughs> as uh, you know. First of all, he's he's not gone away like so, unlike so many people in, in Trump's world. Uh, but he was there really at the start. He was someone who was an early advisor for Trump uh, with Sessions. You know, really pushed the immigration issue that's so uh, you know front and center for Stephen Miller. Uh, that seems to me like the really natural fit to this securitarian mindset. I mean, it is not utilit- you know, unitarian, you know, whatsoever. Yeah, no, I think that's a good point. And, you know, one of the things uh, that I think is sometimes missed about Trump himself is uh, you, you'll hear it said that, well, this is kind of an act and he's just been really shrewd and in, in, uh, realizing that there's a segment of the population that would be into this kind of thing. So he adopted that. And I really don't believe that. Um, I think this is Trump very deeply. This is who he is. And, you know, I go back to his reaction to the uh, the Central Park Five. Remember that way back when, sure. uh, long before he was into politics. And uh, even when it came out that these these uh, five uh, African-American fellows were innocent, it didn't matter to Trump. He just plunged ahead because I think uh, that to me revealed where, where he's really coming from. So, and I think a lot of securitarians out in the world, the ordinary rank and file, to me, they're very astute at picking up who's with them and who isn't. And, and they're, they're concerned about this, that you know, they might have a Republican nominee who kind of says the right things, but doesn't really feel that. You know, I think they certainly saw that in John McCain and in Mitt Romney, the last two Republican nominees. They said, yeah, okay, they got a pretty good voting record on immigration kinds of issues, but they don't have that kind of emotional uh, kind of visceral reaction that that they pick up with regard to Trump. He, he really is one of them. And I think part of the way, reason that works is that he doesn't have to put on an act and they would sense it if he was. Yeah, no, I mean, I've, I've spent time with Mitt Romney. In fact, one time since I live next door to Iowa, uh, I spent half an afternoon where it was supposed to be a Romney rally in a small town, uh, gathering around a picnic table. In the end, it proved to be three of us and the Romney family. So I, I had four hours, you know, wow. with a, a group of less than 10 of us hanging out with Mitt Romney. There's no way uh, the t- kind of people you're describing would go for a Mitt Romney, in my opinion. Right. Um, it's also true that although Trump shows a lot of anger and pronounced anger, really, I think the defining emotion for Trump is one, sadness, grievances, and, and the other one is disgust. I mean, the guy is, after all, a germaphobe. And doesn't have a lot of close friends. And I, I really do agree with you that I, I think there's this distinction. He doesn't like anything that's unfamiliar. This is someone who doesn't travel much overseas as a leader. I don't think he's ever been to Africa in his life. I wonder, I think one time he's been to South America, maybe maybe more than once, but very rarely. This is not a man who likes to travel. He likes to be uh, within the fortress, within the, the penthouse, within the White House, with, on the golf course. Familiar things is what this guy seems to go to. So you've mentioned mask a few times. And I mean, obviously, that's the thing that's still roiling us. 
Is there other ways that we're going to see issues over the horizon? I mean, that's a health crisis that's not going away. But I'm thinking about a vaccine when it comes. Are these people going to accept that the vaccine, uh, which comes from you know possibly Oxford University, is, is legit? I mean, what else is their instinct for the familiar and not being imposed on going to lead us to? I think you're right to raise a concern about that because their their instinct is to be suspicious, especially if this is kind of something that's coming from the scientific community. They want the information to come from people that they trust that are cut from the same cloth as they are and that they know have the security of this group of insiders as their number one goal. And if the, if the perception of the vaccine is that that's not the case, uh, that it could be a trick or it might not be purely American uh, or it, it seems to be endorsed by people on the left, then I think it is going to be a problem to get people uh, from that corner of the population to really sign on to, to using the vaccine. Okay. Well, when I think about people who want security, then my mind goes in part to, well, guess what? Climate change is a big game changer, uh, certainly a threat, but uh, it would seem from what you just said, since that again comes from scientists, uh, they're not likely to, to sign on to that as a as a big threat. W- what are, if we go to physical and cultural security issues, what are the biggest threats to these people besides immigrants? I mean, what else do they see as a terrorist? What what, what else do, is on their their top of the list? I would say liberals. In the, <laughs> okay, um, and, and I, I, I'm quite serious about that actually because it's uh so basically I should put it more diplomatically. They're, they're concerned about immigrants and uh, people already in the country who aren't really signed on to the American way of life from their perception. And then those people like, uh, they believe people on the left who are not really uh, buying into it either and who are too chummy with, with outsiders. And that makes them suspicious. So, um, you know, Im- immigration is certainly the number one issue. That's where you see it most clearly. Race is there too. Um, you know, to me, a lot of this goes back to evolution. And when we were in hunter-gatherer bands, which we were for hundreds of thousands of years, the major threat to us was the tribe over the hill. And so, you know, it wasn't we didn't understand uh, uh, climate change or we, we knew we couldn't do anything about it in those small bands. And, and the same with disease. Those things just happened. But they could do something about, about that outsider, that guy. Um, with with a weapon, and so that that to me is what it all comes back to, and that I hope helps a little bit in kind of understanding why they seem to be that why modern Trump supporters seem to be so cavalier about some threats such as climate change and a virus, but then they really lock on to threats from as you say terrorists and immigrants and the might of foreign countries. That was one of the items in the survey that that really generated a big response. Trump supporters are, are very concerned about those kinds of things. So it's kind of a physical, a human manifestation of threat, not just uh, some amorphous uh, virus. Yeah, no, I'm a pretty big fan of evolutionary psychology. I read it pretty closely. And, and this whole focus on, you know, friend or foe is, is very basic. And skin color obviously can be used as that, as well as cultural signals. We see Trump, of course, Talking about, you know, does Biden love God? Do Democrats love America or not? Um, what about China? I mean, it is clearly authoritarian. Uh, Trump, though, has at least himself some authoritarian instincts and has been a fan of a lot of authoritarian leaders. I mean, China's a threat. Is this something that they're going to uh, sign on that one, at least, even if it's not global warming? I think so. You know, I, I think there might be uh, yeah, those kinds of things, the might of foreign countries, if they really see the foreign country as a threat. And I think it's kind of interesting. They, you know, they don't seem to see uh, Russia as a threat. Uh, they're not a great economic power right now. And, you know, they're not making noises about sending their people over here or anything like that. So I think that, uh, you know, it's, it's a little bit easier for them to tolerate somebody like Putin, who does sing their language and may have helped Trump get reelected or get elected rather. Uh, but China, on the other hand, you know, I think they see as a real threat, just maybe not militarily, although potentially that too, but certainly economically, uh, that's a threat to uh, to America. And I think that's why a lot of Trump supporters can work up a good lather about China. And especially now, if some of these stories are true about uh, China kind of working behind the scenes to to get Trump uh, to lose in, in 2020, that would certainly certainly only increase those kinds of tendencies. 
Sure. Well, Putin, of course, is Caucasian. He has wrapped himself in the, you know, the flag of the the, the uh, Russian Orthodox Church. He's been against homosexuality. Yeah. Uh, China is, you know, not religious officially. Uh, probably even anti-religious. It's Asian, uh, and it's got economic might, which you know Russia does not have. Um, you know, so I, I guess that's an interesting one. But you know, you you mentioned these are people who are not so worried about economic threats. But uh, China, as it harnesses technology and 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 grows its its initiatives overseas, uh, will bring a an economic threat uh, yeah. to not just the U.S. but elsewhere. Right, that's true. No, I I didn't mean to say that there are no concerns about economic threats. I just think a lot of it looks like economics when it really isn't. And even that's a good example. Yeah. When when Trump was talking about trade in 2016, he would always say, "Well, you know." China and Japan, they're killing us on trade, and we're no longer going to be subservient when I become president. So it was kind of economics, but really more a, a country competition kind of thing. And I think that's that's the way they see it. So China is a threat, yes, economically, and that means they're a threat to, to these insiders' way of life. And I, I'm glad your description of China and, and Russia and how that kind of played out differently, you know, being Asian, have different skin color, um, the attitude toward God, I think all those things are, are very relevant. I couldn't have said that better myself. In fact, the God thing, you know, Trump really doesn't go to church very often. And no, I, I don't imagine. Um, but, you know, the, for him, it, it's not really religion so much as Christianity as part of this whole American shtick, the, the insider thing. And uh, the same with the military in many respects. I mean, Trump uh, uh, weaseled his way out of, of serving. So you'd think that might be damaging in, his eye, in the eyes of, of supporters who, who value security. But as long as he... he, he he doesn't have to participate himself, but if he sees value in that and, and in religion and in the military, then that's that's really what they want. To liberals, it seems like he's being a chicken hawk, but I think from the perspective of a securitarian, he's still advocating what's in this kind of central wheelhouse of Americana. Okay. Um, before we run out of time, I want to give you an opportunity either to uh, hit on some key point that we haven't yet addressed, or I'd be interested in knowing, since your book is looking to the world beyond Trump, uh, what you are working on next uh, in terms of your scholarship. Uh, either, either, how, either way, either direction in terms of how you want to take that question. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, let me, maybe one thing that I probably didn't stress enough in my comments so far is th this attitude toward immigrants, which again, I think is, is essential. Um, and we talked a lot about fear and threat. And what I found, found interesting in the survey responses was that a lot of Trump's base would answer questions like, do you think immigrants make America better? Many of them said yes, not a majority, but there were a surprising number who said yes. Do immigrants commit less crime than other Americans? And a lot of Trump supporters said yes. So I focused on them just a little bit. And it turns out that these individuals still wanted immigration to stop or, or to be reduced, even though they said, uh, Americans are, are sorry, immigrants are, are good people who make the country better and don't commit crime. So I wanted to emphasize that they don't need to be scared to think that these other people should stay away. You know, the, the vision of Trump and his supporters is that we've got our country, you've got yours, you stay in yours, we'll stay in ours, and the world's going to be a better place as a result of that. It's not just that they they think those other people are terrible and they're scared of them. That's really not necessary for a Trump supporter's worldview. All they need to do is say that the world works better when people stay in their own little areas of emphasis. And and that to me is very different than a fascist attitude, which was to say we need to go attack everybody. To say, In fact, Trump had a, a great speech, great in terms of, of, I think, revealing what he's really like to the United Nations, where he said, we'd like every country to be strong. You know, go off and be strong in your own little part of the world. And I think that's just a really fascinating attitude for somebody who's supposed to be a fascist. You'd think he'd say, we want to be stronger than everybody else. They don't. They want to be separate from everybody else, which I think is oftentimes misunderstood. No, no, I think that's a that's a good distinction to to make. I think immigration, outsider, insider, all of that's really central. One of the things as you were giving that last answer, I was thinking, stay in your own place. But the truth of the matter is global warming is already destroying uh, the growing season and the economic viability in places like Central America, Honduras, and so forth. I mean, the number of people from Africa, from uh, South America, Latin America in general, who are going to be on the move, trying to stay alive in a world changing through global climate change is is going to be... Uh, 
butting up against this securitarian instinct, uh, not just in America, but elsewhere. Yeah, but now if a securitarian heard that statement of yours just now, Dan, they would say, this is all the more reason we need to double our efforts to keep these people away. You know, the barbarians are going to be at the gates more than ever. And therefore, in order to preserve what they see as the American way of life, they're going to have to be extra vigilant. And by the way, vigilant is a, is a term that they love. Um, one of the survey items used that term, and that really generated a big distinction between Trump supporters and other conservatives. So the notion that if, if we're not vigilant, we're going to be taken over. Trump supporters sign on to that immediately. And so I think they would say, you're probably right. This is going to, the world's going to get messier and messier, and people are going to want to come more and more to the United States. And therefore, we have to do more to stop them. Yeah, well, there are behavioral economic uh, studies that show we even like people who, uh, you know, have the same street name as the one we live on. Uh, so it goes way beyond skin color. If they have the same first name, we tend to, you know, orient to, toward them more readily. Uh, and I'm I'm putting that in one corner, and I agree that's how they're going to respond. And then I'm also thinking, gee whiz, I, I see estimates that you could, thanks to global warming, end up with, you know, I don't know, 700 million people on the move trying to find some place that's secure and that they can raise their family in. So, um, you know, I think I if you that. if you really lots want, of clouds on the horizon. If, if you want to persuade Trump supporters to do something about that, you're probably going to have to couch it in terms of national efforts and competition, because this is just the way they see the world. You know, you're, you're kind of taking a more unitarian point of view. That, you know, we've, we've got these obvious problems that we need to unite to address. And that is not the instinct of securitarians. They're going, but if you can say, look, you know, uh, global warming is affecting Florida and it's weakening the country. You know, a lot of the military leaders have been saying this is a, a major threat to the security of the United States. As soon as, as Trump's base starts to buy that argument, then I think they'll be willing to do something about global warming and climate change. But the, the notion that it's just it's a, the world's problem and it's your moral obligation to do something about it, that argument is simply a non-starter for them. No, no, I recognize that. And I, I confess I'd like the country to do well. And uh, do I have my doubts about the UN's effectiveness? Uh, yes, I do, in fact. But uh, we'll leave it there for today. Uh, I want to thank you, John, so much for your time. Uh, thank you again for being a guest on Dan Hill's EQ Spotlight. Uh, this has been episode number 15, Exploring Misunderstandings About Trump's Quote-Unquote Deplorable Fans. My guest is John Hibbing, the author of Securitarian Personality, What Really Motivates Trump's Base and Why It Matters for the Post-Trump Era. To check out other episodes or my books or appearances on other people's podcasts, feel free to visit my company's website at the obligatory three W's and sensorylogic.com. There you'll also find your opportunity to contribute to a new book that I'm at work on and I'm partially crowdsourcing. It's called The Devil's Dictionary of Work Life, and you can find online terms that you can add your own diabolical definitions for. If you've got any follow-up questions for today's guest, feel free to email me at dhill at sensorylogic.com. And if you enjoyed today's episode, please be sure to give it a five-star rating or a view online at iTunes. Social media support is, of course, always gratefully received. Finally, I'd like to conclude every episode with an appropriate epigram. As we've been talking about security and a desire for order in an uncertain world, I'm going to end with this quote from the social activist, women's suffragette leader, and definitely Unitarian mindset, Jane Addams, who once said, the good we secure for ourselves is precarious and uncertain until it is secured for all of us and incorporated into our common life. Until next time, be kind and stay safe.